All right, Muriel, Muriel, Naim, Na Muriel. I, you know, I told you my phobia about names. Did I do it? It was correct, Muriel Naim. Muriel Naim, sweet. Um, so we spoke about your film, Yannick Bastard. It was great, um, very mature film. And so I tasked you with a pretty, um, I think, challenging task. Your top three directing tips, tricks, best practices. And that involves directing cast, crew, and camera. Mm -hmm. And you took it on. <laughs> so yeah, I love, I love, I love those intersections. So yeah, it was enjoyable for me too. <laughs> cool, cool. All right, well, take it away. Where do you want to start? Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, maybe focusing on living sets. Um, oh, yes which is a concept that uh, I'm sure in some way, shapes or form exists in the world of uh, directors uh, in some ways. Um, I wasn't aware of it, but I can talk a little bit about background to, uh, to what even, where it even came from. I can maybe start with just what is it uh, that yeah. I did on set. That's so, great. Yeah. So um, I'm looking at a bit maybe into uh, a little bit about working with actors because um, I don't have like a set method. It's always changing. Um, and I can talk about the way of thinking of what is required, which I think for one of my favorite things in this whole craft. Um, so I'll start with living sets. So what we did um, specifically in the Anak Bastard, but um, to be honest, I'm probably gonna repeat that in some other types of makings is the concept of having a real, kind of a real scene happen on set and they saying that, because of course you have the, you know, suspended disbelief on the shoot, but having something repeat itself in a very systematic manner, which is very much taken from, uh, I think from theater in many ways, you know, people that worked on theater table work um, and working with actors, uh, there's a bunch of European methodologies of repetition. So what we did is basically there was living sets of the actual existing situation. So it wasn't just repeating the text or repeating the scene, it was creating the situation for a prolonged amount of time and then plopping the actor um, that was not a part of the living set situation into the scene um, and basically let it be. So it's kind of like a mix of two very different methodologies. Um, one of them is uh, this intense repetition, uh, not just on the scene again, but on the environment of the scene, which is maybe something a little unique. Perhaps I didn't think about it, but I just needed, I felt like I needed to do that. Uh, for two of my actors and then for my child actor who did not know the script and uh, knew very little about the script um, I was able to get almost always his first takes which were the best so what you see here is a result of working with actors you can only find it through rehearsals it doesn't mean you need to do a lot of rehearsals but you can understand your actor's style and how they shine through um, working through things in rehearsals so I realized I had two actors, um, like mature actors uh, that really use the repetition. One of them is coming from ballet. One of them is coming from theater. And I could see that the more we repeated things in the rehearsal process, uh, you know, basically kind of dismantling the text, right? Which is a very theater centric process. Um, and then uh, creating actions on top of it and all that. Uh, the more they became familiar with it, the better they were in matters of, right? Suspending disbelief or really being in their characters' bodies. And my child actor, the more he did the, the, the repetition, it actually became a bit repeated. It seemed a bit like a, kind of like a, a doll that repeats itself. So I was like, wow, okay, I have like a first take actor. It doesn't matter child or not child. And I have repetition actors. And one of them was also a, kind of a body. A, a, I used the Laven uh, um, methodology on him, which is also taken a bit from theater. Laven? Laven. How, how do you spell it? Laban, I think it's, I mean, I know it's in Hebrew, but I think it's L-A-B-E-N. I may uh -huh. be totally wrong, uh -huh. um, which talks about the just four kind of four structures of like, there's a uh, fire, uh, wind, uh, water, um, air, fire, wind, and air. And, and I worked on this with him because he's a very much body work person. So I essentially had three types of uh, very different actors on this scene that's very naturalistic. So to bring this naturalisticness out of them, each of them required something else. How do you do that? I came up with this just idea of like, let's have the repetition of the actions for my dancer actor. We needed to be in the body of this character as for as long as it possibly could be. And it started ahead of time. So 
we didn't necessarily start trolling, but we're sitting around him. It's like no one could talk to him. And he started the repetition of the scene. Of course, like he started with rehearsals. Um, he was doing an action as well. So he wasn't just sitting around. He was actually carving a little dog from wood. And when you're talking about rehearsal, you're talking about pre-production. You're talking about offset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's offset. But the, live, the living sets was a rolling mechanism. It was a shooting mechanism. It wasn't a rehearsal mechanism. It was on set. Okay, so to to kind of get it very concrete, because I think yeah. the first thing that's emerged that's very interesting is that you have different types of actors, and different types of actors need different um, different approaches to get yep. their best. So 100%. I think that's really critical to you know say and to get out there for anybody watching. Um, yeah. The other thing is let's sort of ground everything in in you know really concrete practices so the living set let's just take it you know kind of the first phase of living set in um uh pre-production rehearsal so that was not in pre-production that was only on production living set was on production it was how we shot okay which is a very wild idea definitely not a typical you know block light rehearse shoot idea so it was definitely you know required and i can talk a little bit about the how and how it could have been done a little bit better on my side um in matter of communication not the methodology because you have this whole machinery of you know 60 plus people <laughs> that have to get their cues and what's not um but to me it was extremely fundamental because actors definitely come first by far okay and so then that was the shooting mechanism so the living sets of the shooting mechanism we did not rehearse living sets in rehearsals okay i just do the styling in rehearsals of the different actors well it sounds like in order to get the living set you there was some there was a rehearsal so you did some intense rehearsals with your two adult actors no i didn't rehearse the scene I rehearse different motions to understand how they work as actors i also don't like exhausting scenes and rehearsals too much so, so what do you mean by you so you began so you gave them the script they read the script you you know uh casted them and then cast them and then you said okay uh we're gonna do two days of rehearsal yeah i think it was about so yeah not nothing too crazy for the kid it was a very different story i okay. did a lot of different types of exercises with them but a rehearsal and maybe that's a whole different workshop but the rehearsal to me doesn't mean repeating the text or placing blocking that's like the most boring thing i think you can possibly do as a director in rehearsal mm -hmm. to me the rehearsal is first of all gaining the understanding in how your actors work best and the only way to gain that is to um do some exercises and the exercises are i invent before the rehearsal based on my interaction with them on the auditions so i have to really do a lot of prep work um you know i don't know if people you know are expecting directors to come into a room talk with the actor for five minutes and then like read the text, put them in the room, probably the most boring process I can possibly imagine um, in matters of like getting the best out of your people. So what I like to do is I get a sense of the person in an audition and I go back and I watch it again. And I watch how they take direction and I watch how I push them and pull them into where I want them to go. And I see how they react. So there's, there's three layers in the way I see the characters, right? There is the character in the page, so my script character. There is the person, who's also an actor, right? And how they are in the world. And they are them as an actor, which I think is a whole another layer. Like, right, many times you can say like, oh, this person is like, I don't know, the loveliest in the world. And the way they work on set, they're like so intense and different. So I think there's different layers. I have to find the mechanism of how can I get the best from the person? How do I talk to them well? from the actor, what is the methodology I'm using to get the character, the most interesting part I can do. And then you have to kind of put it together. So um, this is like a step back to the process, but there was a whole process of what is a rehearsal. When I talked about Laban, um, I realized I was, I wanted to work with my, my father actor. Um, he had a really beautiful posture and the character is a, you know, welding worker. He works in the field. He's like very, you know, uh, scrappy and uh he's older to his age and he's still working he's been working for 20 20 plus years in the forest and this ballet dancer that has the, the chops for acting came into rehearsal and i was like okay let's just start doing some basic walking exercise i wanted to see if he can find the walk and i realized he was just his posture was perfect um doesn't matter what i said it was kind of like always very nicely uh attached and i was like oof i need to somehow take away the natural posture of the person 
find the baseline of the actor and then get into the character work. So what I did in that, actually, it was kind of weird if anyone would love to work into the script. For, specifically for this actor, I didn't repeat the words with him. I didn't talk about the scenes with him. I wanted to get his physical body working first because I knew that a lot of the other things he's got in the bucket already. I wasn't worried about the other things. I needed the body work. I needed him to be real to the character. And I knew it's going to be my, my, my biggest challenge in the, in the audition already. I could already see it there. So within an hour of walking in a circle and doing some labor, which is um, grasping to a texture, um, grasping to one of these four elements, and then very, 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 very slowly feeling it in the body and shifting, really shifting this, you kind of call it, I think it was like a concrete kind of like wrinkled tree that really helped him like hone on the body of this character. And at the end of the day, he had to walk. So to bring it back, what I needed to do with him is repetition. Uh, because his body is what needed to be in motion with the action. So that was one part of my set, my living sets that I had the idea for. I just understood how he's working. He was a, very much a dancer. Also, it's a very talented actor, but coming from a dancing perspective. So he needed the outside in. That's one actor. The second actor, uh, Maritza, I've discussed. So she really was um, having a hard time with the text. And I was like, until I get her to get out of her mind with the text, I won't be able to. It wouldn't feel as naturalistic as this specific scene needs to feel like. So we did an enormous amount of repetition and table work on the text. Um, and then one of the things that I realized she really would need, and I only realized it through her rehearsal, it's kind of more like a typical rehearsal work, right? Table work and then a little bit of repetition. I realized that she needs uh, to do something with her hands. <laughs> um, so we found kind of a repetition on rehearsal, but I was like, it needs to be real. It kind of matched with the script because she needs to pluck chickens, real chickens. Uh, obviously, obviously dead chickens that died in natural circumstances because that's an AFI rule. So, um, so I was like, all right, I have an actor that needs repetition with his body. I had another actor that can use something very similar, but needs repetition with text. And then I have the kid. And the kid, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, what was her issue with the text? Well, it was a foreign language <laughs> to begin with, uh, so Polish. Um, she told us in the rehearsal, I remember that I asked her. It's still funny to me to this day, but like, you know, actors will say anything in an audition. Um, she said she's half Polish and I was like, wow, great. <laughs> it's not the reason I took her to the role, but she was not, she was, you know, I think she was Chilean. Um, but, you know, she was really just the right person for the role. Um, so while not knowing <laughs> that she's not half Polish and she can speak Polish because she couldn't, uh, we did a lot of teaching, um, but then, you know, you have these two layers of like dismantling the text. One of them is just the text by itself, so you can make it anything and morph it into anything. The other thing is the language barrier. So you have to, first of all, this, you know, fully connect the meaning to the words, and then you have to take away the meaning from the words, which is a really weird process. Um, so there's a bunch of work there with her on that. Uh, she was great. And then I had a kid who already in auditions, I understood from the fact whenever I gave him an action, I got something a little weird in, in return. I understood that he's a great gut feeling actor. He's a wonderful, like one, like, you know, one and one and done actor. And he was also very young. Um, and I won't dive too much into his audition, but it's just interesting to, again, you can get so much from audition. You don't have much time with the director on set. You don't have much time with the director on rehearsal. People don't have time. You know, the, the bigger they are, the busier they get and like the harder to set time, but you have to meet with them at least once or twice. You have to do some work. And if it's a bigger film, obviously more work to make sure that you can pull this out in the shoot, which is such an expensive, you know, minute by minute place. The more you do work in pre-production, the less you have to do a lot of work. People thought I'm really weird on set because I would say something like spark or grandma and like something will happen to the actors. It's because you work before and there's like something trigger in their brain and they just pull it in, you know, from like physical memory or a mental memory or emotional memory, right? Like there's a bunch of methods there I think you can connect it to. Um, but they connect the feeling or they connect the trigger in the body, not themselves. I really don't appreciate stress, stress bringing in that, not the sense of like what they were in this situation. If you did like any type of like imaginary, uh, work. Um, so getting back to it, I had this one physical repetition, uh, really dense director that needed physical, uh, actions and the, and the same environment to get into the body of his character. Uh, otherwise it wouldn't feel as real as I wanted it to feel. I had one actress who needed a repetition of words ahead of time. And then when she's on set, needed the real, real action. And also, thank goodness, put a long and elongated action in your script if you have these actors, because plucking a chicken takes a while. 
so she could just focus on this very real gritty work and it actually gave her her body language i wasn't worried about her body language as much as for the the father then for the kid it was the hardest part and where you know the only thing i would change in the process that i did is just communicate a bit more to my crew exactly what's happening at every single point i would have to roll camera on the rolling set so we would start the set with the dad carving the wooden dog i would plug in the mother who would be just plucking the chicken and they did that while everyone was setting up around them, they just created a little bubble in their mind and they just were doing, getting into their characters for a while. Um, even before we were in this location, inside this, um, outside the, this little house, when they were setting up like, I think production design and, and stuff like that. Um, I already told the mother to go to the area in the forest that's really, really abandoned and my second AD to keep her eye, an eye on her um, and start plucking, we had a bunch of chickens, um, just start plucking chickens. All the way there and repeat her words again and again and again and again so that she did pre work for like maybe i think 45 minutes at the end it was and i just she i would literally she was like don't put you know just just bring me into this and i was like great so i just took her you know, the second they took her placed her in her location and she kept plucking them you know gazing at the dead repetition she was in it for like maybe an hour uh, at the end of the day the father as well like the timing is super delicate there like making sure exactly that they're not exhausted but they're super in their body and it can become really naturalistic and it was so naturalistic and it was super important for me to sell the world in this simple scene. And then the kid had to be plucked in after starting to roll, right? Because if he only has one take for the real reaction, he didn't know what's happening in the scene. He just went naturally to, obviously, you know, he wants to, well, you're kind of in the 50-50 of it. Are you gonna, is he gonna help his mom plucking chickens or is he gonna help his dad carve a dog with like a knife? Guess what a kid in this age would wanna do, obviously. So you naturally went this direction. It was actually, actually, actually how the script was written, but I was like, this is gonna be natural. It's gonna work really well. He would want to be a part of that. I didn't say a word to him. I just let him be in the moment. And we didn't we need to do it again, by the way, which is okay. Cause the action, the big uh, contrast of the, of the scene, the conflict point, like kind of like boiling point only happened later. So I could just stop it, rewind. They kept rolling, which everyone in the editing room and my cinematographer wanted to kill me cause they just kept rolling. But it was a part of this living set situation. And I knew the actors in this specific scene were more important than our block light rehearse shoot mechanism. And we have to work around and them. What? So they're like the block light rehearse shoot, kind of like, you know, like the industry model, right? Of like shooting. Um, block this couldn't light be that. Rate. Yeah, you block, uh, you block the scene, which I you do roughly, but, you know, I don't really believe in it too much. I think it needs to come from rehearsal. And then you light it. Of course, the teams have to work. And not just light, of course, there's a bunch of like touches to make and all that. Um, and then you rehearse it, supposedly. I didn't do it with the kid. I didn't do it with them as well because I would rehearse. And then you shoot it. So basically what we did is instead of block, I took an extra to place the, where the kid is going to go and what is it going to do. So they can, of course, light and prep. And there's a lot of teams that have to work around this placement. Um, but it was a bit of a, you know, it was a challenge for all these teams because they didn't have the actor doing the motions. I think it doesn't matter because blocking is actually like, you know, oh, you walk here, you do this, you do that. There's no, there's no acting involved. And it really is about kind of creating this magic on set. To me, this magic for the kid was plugging him in in the right time and seeing how he react to this gut. He's a great gut actor. Um, I'm sure did now. He, did he have six lines? Years old. Um, so he didn't have lines in this scene, which was wonderful. And actually what I did, because I got this actor and I was like, oh God, I have an actor who is wonderful. But if he knows things in advance too much, it's just not the same impact that I want to get. It's still good, but it's not what I'm looking for. It's like really guttural core feeling that I got from this boy in the audition when I took away text. So what I did is actually took away a lot of text from the film, from the kid, mm -hmm. so I can get the real reaction. Mm -hmm. And he's still making actions, but less about the text, more about the things he's seeing and doing. Yeah. Um, so I adjusted a lot based on the actors. I think it's huge. I think actors are core. They're in the middle. They're the point. They're people. They're what you're looking at. Everything else is super important, but the actors are top, top of mind. Um, not just lighting them well, and of course. You know, dressing them well, yeah. which is super important and creating everything around them, which is super important. And of course, the, the artistry of If you film. don't believe them, you don't believe anything else. Exactly. Yeah. And if you yeah. believe them, a lot of other things can be right. very good, yeah. but forgiven or not yeah. perfect or not you know, superb. They can be yeah. great. Yeah. And if they're amazing and that's amazing, jackpot. Right. But if you don't have the acting under the, you know, under the gun, if you don't have it, that's it. if I don't believe my own, my own, if I don't believe what's happening on screen, who, who cares how gorgeous it is? It doesn't to me. matter. Yeah. So that's what it was. It was a bit of a, I guess, I guess I didn't realize how layers, how many layers are in this process of creating the living set. But 
yeah, the living stuff was the result of understanding their different motions. And then okay. the way you shot it was a rolling shot mechanism. So there was tail slating. We actually started rolling. I tapped the shoulder of the cinematographer because I didn't want the awareness to be drawn to both the actors and the kid in the specific scene that has to be so, you know, quiet, serene, and almost really naturalistic. Um, I didn't want the whole, you know, lighting and boom and action and right, all these right, cool right, things. Right, like right, it just right. felt so foreign to this like yeah, yeah. 40s environment in the, the rural Poland. It just felt course. kind yeah. of Hollywoodish and, and, and right. wrong for the scene. Right. So we did tail slating, we did rolling takes the whole scene. Um, so rolling like, takes, so fingers. the camera keeps falling, you tail slate after the end of the first take. And no, then, no, no, rolling take means you don't tail slate after you finish all the takes in the same scene. So there's no resetting. Basically what we did is we started shooting. I tapped the shoulder. So there's no start slating, right? Tail slating okay. is just at the end of the shoot. Um, we did at tail slating and takes. rolling. Yeah. So oh. rolling takes means you want cut. Right. And of course you can only, only already imagine how much, how much, uh, that's the part that I really, uh, I loved learning from this. I needed to communicate even further what I had in mind. And I was a bit of a creature when I thought about it, I didn't communicate too much what it's going to mean. And you have to just communicate. If you do something like this in advance, you do have to stay in advance. Hey guys, we're going to do rolling takes for the acting in the scene, which means we need a bunch of, you know, patience. <laughs> we need a lot of quietness for a while, which is tough, quiet and set, a lot of people on set, large set. Sure, sure. Um, and then, um, um, and a lot of adjustments after, you know, after we roll for the first time, second time. So it's really tough on the cinematographer. Um, oh yeah. Not just because there was motion, but also oh, yeah. because, because um no it's like a challenge uh, but also because uh, uh right they have to set up what if they have to reset a light what if something has to be blocked what if something has to be adjusted they have to kind of work around the action of course i would consider they need to adjust something that's totally okay but the cut and the action and the slating wasn't right for the scene so it was a big undertaking it was tough it was it's not easy to do rolling takes um so you tap your director what do you tell your actors i tap my cinematographer or cinematographer um, sorry <laughs> And what uh, do you tell your actors? So the actors are already in motion. They're they in are not. They they've been doing it for an hour, so they're already in the scene. Well, that's the chicken plucking and the carving. But I'm imagining exactly. that that's one thing. But what about right. when they're actually die in dialogue together inside the house? So I wouldn't use it for a dialogue scene because you have to have a starting yeah. factor. Right. It was only used because it was a. It was technically. A okay. Little, like a slice okay. of life. So you really sexual. like you really went to yeah. town on just the actions of chicken plucking yes. and carving. Good Absolutely. God. Absolutely. Yeah. God. All right. And so, it was really big because it was a, like a repeated action, and they didn't stop. But you gained some kind of like I didn't strictness. Again, momentum, and I don't know if I don't know if momentum because it's actually the opposite of it. You gain yeah. like boringness of the action, and that's what I needed for the scene. It's not a special thing to collect chicken she does it every day well true you know but... like kind of taking away the taking away the excitement from these actions and making it a day-to-day -day. right it's wonderful to the repetition for them on top of their acting skills and you, you asked about like the beginning of action or rather the beginning of dialogue i don't think the beginning of action is with any action i don't think dialogue is like necessarily kind of the, the tipping point but uh absolutely there was the kid answering um to your question really weird so i had in the beginning the first take i was with the kid that was a big trust thing me for me there we set up the shot we kind of locked it down right then i said all right i tapped the shoulder of the cinematographer i went around because i wanted to say something to the kid before he enters the scene so i went around ran around basically and i wanted to tell him something before he enters so i told him what to do right that it started and he opened the door he had no idea what's going to happen but he opened the door and kind of like you got like the reaction you get like the real reaction of like what's happening which is a bit you know, we, we didn't take the first first take, obviously. Um, he wanted to disorient himself a little bit, so it was okay to do it again. But I wanted him to enter with a certain pot, with a certain guttural feeling in his body. And because I worked with him a little bit before um, in the rehearsal, uh, we placed there was so here like a little kids kids uh, directing. There's a lot here, um, but um, he needed to uh, imagine a person that he thinks about that he has a really intense reaction towards to bring this fire. And he came, it came a little loaded to the scene, so I had to like just bring the war that I knew was going to trigger him, which is someone in his, you know, extended family or something. So I kind of plucked the word inside, and I was like, "You're going to do this. You're going to do that, and that's it. Whatever happens, happens." And I tapped this, and I wanted to be close to him, so I was actually in the room. I wasn't in next to the camera when it was actually rolling. 
technically action started. And he basically inserted the action into the scene. So once it started, you know, the parents knew what to do and they had the dialogue and, and whatever needed to happen. And it was oriented in space. Now, it didn't always work perfectly in the first shot, on uh, the first take. Sometimes it was the second take, uh, but it still didn't and have- rolling the whole time. You're rolling the whole time. Because okay. here's the thing about rolling takes that I kind of almost was forced to do with my kids on set. The second you cut the scene, the second you say, okay, cut. They break character. They break character. They break, everything breaks, right? Like it sets up things. There's like all this mechanism happening around. Now, if you have like tenured actors that have been working for 30 years in the industry, sure, I don't know, like, sure, you know, like sure. top, right. like, yeah. they all maybe can suspend this belief really right. well. But when you have yeah. actors from different walks of life, some of them oh, are yeah. non-actors, oh, yeah. some of them are kids, you really have to cherish the disbelief and maintain it and contain it as much as you possibly can. So like you have to almost treat them like, like something, there was a vibe in the shoot that was very specific. Um, and it was a bit like, there was like tension that I, I wanted to create on set <laughs> to have this level of underlying turmoil sure. um, kind of inflicted yep. into yep. all the scenes. So uh, long story short, we did the rolling take. So he did that. And I was like, all right, let's go back to one. It was just a rehearsal. I kept saying it's just a rehearsal. Mm. And I did it again for the kid. Of course, the actors knew I was rolling. The kid didn't. He felt we were rehearsing the whole shoot. Mm, mm. And then it ended, he's like, all right, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna shoot. Yeah. And I was like, oh, we already shot everything. So to take the, the pressure away from not just sure. him, but the other kids yeah. as well, I kept saying, yeah. like, okay, rolling on, okay, we're just gonna do a rehearsal. Okay, we're gonna go and rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah. All right, go go for the rehearsal. At some point, he understood, oh, it's a rehearsal. So I'm just going to go inside and I figure it out. And he felt a bit more confident. Um, we always rolled on the rehearsals. It wasn't a rehearsal. Yeah. It was obviously yeah. the shoot itself. We did tell settings that when we finished the rehearsal, after, let's say, one resetting without cutting, without big changes of, you know, so you'll makeup say is coming reset, in, whatever. Right? You'll say reset. I'll say, um, all right, cool. Um, let's go back to one. We'll take it again. Okay. And uh, Maria is going to, the second idea is going to tap you, you know, to kind of, to, to enter again. Got it. Great. Just, yeah. I kept, was like, okay, yep. nothing yep. changed. No big yep. things. My voice is the only one. Super soft. Like, very yep. like, all right, cool. Let's do it again. Yep. Like, just trying stuff out. Like, yeah. the whole time we're shooting. So yeah. I could do whatever I want from all of these takes. And it was not many takes. There was maybe, maybe two, three takes at a time. That's uh, it. Rarely there was more. That's great. Yeah, and it was an orderly take, so my editor and my assistant editor really wanted to kill me because it's definitely a hard job for an editor at the end, right? Like to, but but it, but but it, but at the end of the day, if you get the right thing, it's like just another few minutes to to do that. Yeah, I know. Well, in AFI, it was a bit uh, tricky. Uh, if you did something out of the norm in the AFI American Film Institute, which is a little that's tricky where you to went do. To school for a little bit, right? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah that's this, and, and, and technically the production house that was uh, uh, like backing the film. Uh huh. It was like, you have to follow a certain amount of rules and exactly how it works. But the whole point of filmmaking is like breaking the standard and doing things that work for your film without hurting anyone, obviously. Um, so to me, that was an essential thing to do. Um, the only thing I would change is just communicating more and saying that this is what it takes. Um, oh, okay, so after this, at, so far, my understanding of a living set is, you know, there's this um, critical portion of, you know, uh, pre-production rehearsal. That's important to get to know your actors. And then at, you bring that into the living set. And the living set is really an environment that you're cultivating um, with a certain um, Efron method methodology. What is it again? We'll That's, post a, well, that was uh, your, your particular kind of method that you use the fire air water thing what was the guy's name that's only for the physical walk in the room for the guy but this is a new house that it's not living sets and oh, honestly i don't know guy. that's just me uh the living sets is something i came up with because i realized i need them to light live in the life of this character and then i wanted to plug in or plug in um rather the 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 the, the, the child actor um nothing i read about it anywhere i just felt like it would be useful for them and it was kind of like an interesting synergy of making it happen if it exists in the world maybe um, I, did I, I learn it somewhere? Saying. No. I get what you're saying. So it was just important for you to create, you know, combined with this, you know, focus on um, capturing like a, con you know, keeping your characters in the character, keeping your actors in the character for a prolonged period of time, doing an action, then yeah. combining that with these rolling takes, 
where mm-hmm. you didn't have the sort of Hollywood kind of standard protocol of cutting and interrupting exactly. the takes. That was kind of your version of just creating and continuing the life of the script, the narrative from take to take, from set, shot to shot, from scene to scene. Because you'd yeah. have to break down your cameras, you'd have to, you know, reposition. Exactly, to... reposition, you have touch-ups, and then like the wardrobe wants to fix something, and makeup wants to fix something, and everyone wants to do something, and I totally get it. But I couldn't have it. So <laughs> I minded well, a bit less those little touch-ups. Well, what what were you doing? So when you have to, you know, do another shoot or another scene and reposition everything, what are you doing in between? Uh, you make the dis- actors disappear from set as soon as possible, and you don't say a word until they're out of there. So I'm a little bit sacred about my actors, maybe too sacred, but well, that's the way. What do you have them do? So you get the actors. Oh out wow, whatever. I'm not. You know, it's whatever they want to okay, do. Okay, so you're not having them pluck, go back to plucking chickens. No, no. Okay. I mean, so if they're, I, they're no, taking a break. Like, they're yeah, they're okay. doing whatever they need to do, and there's a lot of like space in between. And you know, the, the definitely on set there was a lot of work required. So like, however they want to work in their own ways, they would go. But again, okay. if there is a next scene and, and there's something in mind, it's like very calculated. There is something that I have in mind that I need. Let's say my bed. There was a walk. The walk was a big walk. It was all the way from the back, all the way to the house. It's a long walk. It was like a full minute walk of the father back from the wood cutting to the house at night and I really needed his body to be working perfectly because you only have one take it's a one it's a one one shot one shot um so what I did is that before um not too long before but basically 30 minutes I asked him to repeat the exercise we did at the end the last five minutes of it and get back to this Laban uh, methodology which he was familiar with because it's actually a it was a director the theater director that also did some uh movement work and I did utilize that I thought it was a really cool thing but actually I kind of took it a step extra because they involve texture and color. So the basic elements of like fire, wind were great. I don't think they were enough. I didn't get enough grittiness from him. So I was thinking while we were in rehearsal, I was like, how do I get more texture from here? And I was like, oh, texture. Mm. So I was like, okay, while you walk, it was like a repetition. It was like really walking in a circle, a bit like a hypnosis almost, you know, that he was there, that the room was half dark, um, middle of the day, very quiet rehearsal room. Uh, he just kind of kept adding elements and I could really see how his body shaping slowly towards these elements. And then there was a lot of muscle memory that I asked him to do. So kind of like, you know, remember the tension of your muscles in your fingers. Remember the tension of your gaze looking forward. Remember your angle. Like you just like kind of kind of repeat that and keep that in your body kind of as almost as a picture of memory of the muscles internally. And you could bring it on set. So he needed just to get back to it. They didn't have to say any word. They just said, do the walk. Mm-hmm. 30 minutes. Is it okay mm-hmm. with you? And he's like, yeah, 30 is great. Maybe even 35. And I was like, awesome, go ahead. <laughs> Uh-huh. He did the walk in, in the forest alone for 30 minutes and he came in and he had to walk. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you can't do those things live. Um, yeah. You can't, you don't have time to do those things live. You need to find a body language. Who knows if it would have taken him. It took him like about, it took us like 50 minutes for the exercise in rehearsal. And it was really, it was like, okay, so I brought the text and I was like, we're not doing any text work today. Um, what if it would take him three hours? Is he allowed? Yeah. If, what if I want to bring him to a whole different direction? What if I see something in rehearsal that I'm like, ooh, that can be way more interesting? To me, that's, that's like the craft of creating these people, you know, in characters and also taking into consideration how they act. That's like one of my, my favorite parts in directing. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's just your mind kind of like grows in different directions and you involve things from life and very you know, from creative. different things. Yeah, it's just Super. Very, and very I love this part. part. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, no, just get can, the best out of your actor, like the best that he can sure, possibly give sure. you in this situation, and you kind of stretch them. Yeah, no, um, it, it's great. It's very thoughtful. You have, you know, a certain structure and it's articulated, and you've got your kind of guides. Um, it's great. Uh, I really like it a lot. Um, definitely, definitely a, a great, great, you know, set of tools. This, I got to post a link, I got to do uh, some research about Efron because I like that kind of. It's just a, a very simple, clear kind of guidelines on, you know, and I think you're in, for, especially for this particular script, you know, the body work and the, you know, getting it sort of internal and not in, out of the intellect, you know, that's, you know, so important. That's a really good call. I didn't think about it in this way, but that's like basically what, what we did, right? With the action yeah. to start ahead of time and not words or situations, right. just the actions. Yeah. You really take, take them out of their mind. Yeah. And we, this yeah. is what we need, right? We needed yeah. this like from these actors in Hollywood. Yeah. That were both really interesting people as well. I needed to bring this like simplistic repetition yeah. 
yeah. day to day that would yeah. cause this family to go yeah. through what they went through. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, we got three minutes left, um, three and a half. So we really got into Drake and Cast, uh, which is great. Now, let's talk about crew and camera and starting with camera. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot to be said in here. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> no pressure. Lot. Yeah, no, it's fine. I Three mean, minutes. <laughs> I would say I will distill a lot of it. Yeah. To say pre-production. Yeah. Can't strike it and can't say it enough. Can't strike it enough. Make sure you have a really solid pre-production process, including testing. Um, so not just testing for the aesthetics. Not just testing for the weird things you want to do on set, like trying things out before you go on set, because again, it's an expensive minute by minute. You won't have the ability to be crazy creative on set. You won't, unless you're very privileged and you're probably also a guy and you also get a lot of money. So I'm saying it's just because it's connected. Uh, you know, statistically, there's more time for guy directors than girl directors. We have to be sharp on the money. So to be sharp on the money and creative, do as much as you possibly can in pre-production, as much test as you possibly can, and Make sure the process you have with your DP is as enriching and as code building, and I'm gonna explain that in a second, as you can, like almost like the rehearsal work, but it's much more um, give and take in that sense, right? It's much more collaboration so that they can pull whatever they need because you know they're not an actor, they're, they're the professional on set. To me, I see them in my level of, uh, of importance. You know, it's like a partner to this process. So when I say pre-production, I love diving into anything but films. <laughs> Um, as references. I really hold myself back from looking at, we can look at some scenes, we can look at some references, we can look into like kind of a technical soul or like really amazing motion that I really want to look into as a starting point, but I can't stand mimicking. Like if something is done really well and you really want the same thing, sure, go ahead. Someone did it before, take it, go ahead. But how do we invent if we don't like start building from somewhere, but then create something new? I love creating something new because I think every film is so unique. Um, no stories alike, just no stories alike. Even if it's the same story, it's told in a different way by a different director, so it's not alike. And I love the most, I think, especially for this film, there was a big emphasis on lighting. There was a big emphasis on um, kind of a, um, a limited resource. Like we almost kind of shot it, the, the styling of shooting and the styling of lighting was very much inflicted by and, 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 and affected by the fact that it was a very poor family. Um, it was affecting everything. It was affecting production design um, because it's actually, they did the research on the 40s. And when I looked into the first meeting with the production designer, I realized that they looked up items from the 40s and I said, no guys, they're poor. It's going to be a hand-me-down. It's going to be from the 20s because they wouldn't buy anything new because they would make it. And if they wouldn't make it, they probably had it for 20 years and it's going to be given to them by their parents or something. And they're like, oh, right. So they had shifted the whole research to the 20s because of the poor family, because, you know, you wouldn't buy new things or get new things from the nearby town. Right. Because right. they barely go to the town. <laughs>